And I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the talk will be mostly a survey about results from the past year or so that uh, I find really uh, cool and uh, interesting and uh, with really beautiful proofs. And then at the end, I have some, uh, some, new, uh, some new results that uh, I'll, I'll mention. Um, uh, what are the white words? Okay, so, so again, if, if you've seen this stuff before, then uh, you know, I, I apologize. My only excuse is that uh, these proofs are so beautiful and short and simple that it's uh, always nice to, uh, to see them again. Um, so th let me start by defining uh, uh, what, what is a cap set. So the, the talk is about the cap set problem and uh, the recent, uh, basically the recent solution or, or of it and uh, connections to other problems. So the, a, a cap set or a set, uh, call it A, and FQ to the N. So FQ is a finite field of size Q. And we th we're going to think of uh, Q as being uh, some fixed prime or prime power and uh, N going to infinity. So we're in the setting. Uh, and traditionally, this was asked, these questions were asked where Q is 3. And uh, it was open for Q equals 3. And, uh, now we kind of know the answer for all Q, so we'll just do it more generally. But uh, so a set is uh, is called a cap set. I'll explain the this weird name. Uh, if it contains uh, no three term uh, arithmetic progressions. Yes, so it's the progression-free set. Uh, the reason it's called cap set is because uh, there's, an, there's a game called set that I've never played, but I, I Googled it. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's played. Uh, the cards are labeled with elements of F3 to the 4. It's 80, 81 cards. And it's, they're not really labeled by vectors. They're, they have you know, colors and signs and uh, pictures. And, but there, there are four, uh, four items that have three uh, types each, and uh, you put cards on the on the table, and then if you have a, a set, a set is a three-term arithmetic progression, which in this case it's just uh, uh, it's a sequence of three cards such that in, in each of the four coordinates they're either fixed, or you see all the different all the three different values. So, for example, you can have. Uh, So this is a set, because uh, all the coordinates are either fixed, or if I change this to you know, one, two, three, uh, that's uh, another set, right? Uh, and that's also, in, in that's, that's, if you think about it, this is just an arithmetic progression. A set that has this property is just an arithmetic, is a three-term arithmetic progression, because you can just, uh, whatever you add to get the second one from the first, if you add it again, you'll get the third value here. So this is a special property of F3, which justifies the name. But from now on, we'll, we're just going to talk about three-term progressions. Once you go to FQ, then this, this kind of uh, analogy. Would you say what you mean precisely by the three-term? Oh, a three-term arithmetic progression uh, is x, x plus y, x plus 2y. It's a three-term, sorry, I should have said that. That's a, that's a three-term arithmetic progression where x and y are in fq to the n. That's a three-term progression. And uh, there, there are other ways to define it, and we'll, we'll, we'll use those later also. So uh, another way to define a three-term progression is as a tuple x, y, z, such that uh, x plus d z equals uh, to y, right? that's equivalent. And you can define this in any abelian group uh, where the characteristic is uh, not two. Uh, let's just write uh, two does not divide q. Uh, otherwise, it's. Uh, so could you say something about the motivation for studying? Campus? Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. The motivation is, is studying three-term arithmetic progressions in in sets. Uh, and uh, I'll say why, why the case of F3 was kind of interesting. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to say now. So the, the more uh, well-studied version of this problem uh, is, uh, 
so something that uh, uh, is the okay. So let me first say wh what is the question that we're interested in. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the the largest possible size of A? Uh, so how large can these sets be? Or in, in other words, the, the, the theorems we'll, we'll try to prove is that if A is large enough, bigger than some value, then it has to contain a three-term arithmetic progression. And that's sort of a Ramsey, uh, it's, it's a Ramsey type theorem. Large enough structures contain, uh, large enough sets contain some structure. And there are other types of theorems. And there are, this is sort of a density type question where, again, if a set is large enough, it contains a progression. You can think of the coloring version. If you color a set, in let's say two colors, one of the colors must contain, uh, let's say, a progression. So, think like Van der Waarden uh, theorem. Uh, so, so the the, the more uh, kind of the, the harder version of this question, and w which is still open. So, this will kind of answer uh, in in this talk. This was what was recently solved. But the question that's still open is, um, um, what about subsets of uh, the integers. And think, think of big N as you know, Q to the N here. So we have the same size. When, how, how large can a, can a set here without three-term progressions uh, be? And this is something that people looked at uh, um, for, for, I think, longer than, than the cap set question. And there's a famous uh, theorem of uh, Roth is that uh, well, there exists some say, delta of n that goes to 0, such that uh, uh, when, n, so when n grows, this delta will go to 0, such that if a is at least, has size at least delta times n, then a contains uh, three-term arithmetic progression. And this was, this was proved using uh, analytic methods. And then, uh, so you can ask this also for any k-term progression. And then this is a famous result of Samaradi that this still holds for uh, k-term progressions. And there's a more recent proof of Gowers that gives the quantitative estimates for delta. And, and this, this type of questions, uh, this, it's, it seems to be a central question in the you know, area of additive number theory. And the results, of the techniques for proving these type of theorems have been very influential. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if this led to ergodic theory being developed, but this was one of, one of the big uh, applications of ergodic theory is proving uh, such results, although ergodic Ergodic proofs don't usually give, uh, or maybe never give, uh, quantitative estimates on delta. So there's, uh, but but ju just that this this question is is a question that leads to beautiful uh, techniques and proofs, as, as we will see. On the other hand, um, let me just say what is known for for this. So what's currently known, before we switch back to to that setting. So for the integers, what's known. Uh, is that uh, this delta n is somewhere between um, log log n to the f sorry to the fifth over log n. This is a risk. Uh, it's a result of Sanders from uh, 2010, improving uh, previous bounds of uh, Bourgain and. Uh, and others, so this was you know, started as square root log n, and but this, this is the best uh, kind of one over log n, roughly, is the best uh, the current techniques give. On the other hand, the, the best construction, so you can ask uh, to, to bound delta from below, you want to construct a large set or a family of large <coughs> sets with no uh, three term progressions. And 
So this is actually the, 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 the record, if, if you ignore uh, low order terms, is still due to uh, Berend from 46. Uh, this is something like uh, something exponential minus square root log n. And I'm ignoring some low order terms that were uh, recently uh, improved by, uh, I think, Elkin. But uh, there's a big gap here. <laughs> and and, and no notice that uh, we'll see that this, well, this doesn't hold over there. So uh, we'll actually show that uh, um, yeah, this, this construction doesn't work in F, F Q to the N, and it can't, because sets this large will have three term progressions. So again, this is one of the, the main open problems, I think, in, in additive combinatorics. And uh, I think a lot of people would be happy to see uh, an improvement on either side. Uh, again, this is very simple also. If you have time uh, at the end, I can, I can show it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. what, what's expected? Is there any, uh, are, and, and nobody <laughs> I, th I think it's uh, I think it's pretty open. I I, I, I really don't know. Uh, even this result that I'm going to show I think was very surprising. So I don't, I don't think we really understand. Uh, this. It, l l let me show you another thing, another recent result that I, I found out about preparing the stock uh, of uh, Burgen and Chang. If we're uh, uh, from I think it's from 16. That if you're looking for top for tuples of the form x x plus y x plus y squared, I think this is in. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I think it's in Z Zn. Maybe n is to be prime, but but it's a similar setting here. But you're not looking for progressions. You're looking for these quadratic type progressions. Then. No yeah, exactly. So you can actually show that uh, once the size of the set uh, is at least n to the, I forgot the constant, but something like some constant less than 1 uh, implies that these exist. So this barren construction is very uh, special to uh, kind of the linear. This is the fact that it's a linear structure. and. It actually, the construction itself is kind of like a, it's a quadratic surface uh, in the integers, kind of. So, so th these things are very confusing. I mean, there's th so this this is definitely the kind of the harder question, and and people looked at this cap set problem uh, as a you know, a similar question in a, in a different uh, setting, somehow to get some more intuition and uh, maybe develop techniques and. You know, see if these techniques work there, or if techniques from here could work here. So it's it's this kind of uh, thing that you know people like to do. If you have a nice question about an abelian group, you know, ask it about other abelian groups and see if uh, if it how it behaves. And, uh, and so the the best results uh, for the capset problem before before the results I'll I'll talk about before last year was. Um, there was a famous paper of Meshulam showing that if, uh, so if A is a cap set, and again, pe people were interested in F3 to the end because that's kind of the most extreme opposite of the integers. Uh, you can't use F2 to the end, right? Because it's, there are no three term progressions. But uh, F3 is the, the smallest one uh, that's interesting. And uh, Meshulam basically said that uh, th this type of bounds, uh, um, I think it's, uh, again, similar arguments to, to what you can do over the integers. You can show that uh, uh, so it's 3 to the n over n, which is something like big n over log n, right? Uh, and, and there was a big excitement when uh, Bateman and Katz could improve this. <coughs> they showed uh, 3 to the n over n to the 1 plus epsilon for some very small constant epsilon. <laughs> 
So you can imagine the, the, this was a state of affairs uh, before, the, before last year, and Bateman and Katz was. Um, so Meshulam is from 94. Bateman and Katz, I don't, I don't remember, but um, I'll have to look but it up. Is there anything about yeah. special about three terms as opposed to you know, K terms? Well, it gets much harder. So, OK, the, the, this, this, the proof here for three term is relatively manageable. Uh, there are several different proofs. Once you want, to, so uh, for just for example, Gauss's proof that gives the quantitative bound, uh, the three term is, uh, I don't know, two or three pages, the four terms is 20 pages, and the full proof is about 100 pages. So it gets much, much, much more complicated. So the Fourier techniques uh, using our L2 estimates give you the three term. If you want to do four term, you need to introduce high order Fourier analysis, for example, or ergodic theory, or, or something. Uh, it well, Furstenberg did it with their with their with that Yes, but that, that's just, yeah, that just gives you quantitative. And uh, of course, the Zemmert is proof, which is a graph regularity. and. Yeah. Again, not very uh, easy. Uh, and these are long, long, heavy proofs, and when k grows, and when k grows, this delta also becomes uh, a bit of a mess here. But you, you, even the quantitative ones are, it's not, you know, it's not log to the k. It's, it's, it's something uh, <laughs> much, uh, or log to the, some tower uh, function. So, Right. So, and, and again, you can ask uh, k-term progressions in f q to the n, where k is less than q, and that's a legitimate uh, question, and th that's still open. One of the things that's well, I'm going to show you a solution for this for three, it doesn't give anything for four, so that's actually one of the. But it's only a year old, so maybe maybe there's uh, yeah. yeah, there's still hope, I think. Uh, okay. So, so this is. The motivation, I don't know. So the bond in the other direction, good. It's a good question. Um, so the, the, the other direction, it's basically some c to the n where c is, uh, well, c is less than q. So it's, some, it's something like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't get here. But it's, yeah, it's, w w yeah. That, it's some point. constant. Well, you can take, uh, let's say in, in F3, you can take 0, 1 to the n. <coughs> OK. <laughs> and then you can also c construct examples for a constant uh, dimension, let's say F3 to the 100, and tensor them. So if you get some good constant in low dimension, you can do some computer search. And there's some competitions for uh, you know people uh, <laughs> push the constant up and okay and okay All right. so good so this is the the, the background and then the the, the big uh, uh, surprise came uh, so there there are two papers the first one was Kurt uh, Lev and uh, Pach which had a real kind of new insight into the problem, which showed that in, uh, so th they, they couldn't really get F3 or, or F cubed, but they, they did something over Z4 to the end. And you can also define uh, you know, three term progressions here. Uh, a cap set. Uh, A must have size at most, uh, well, c to the n, where c is less than 4. So they really uh, kind of sh sh showed that this, uh, you cannot have anything like Baron construction. Uh, it's really an exponential uh, size. And right after that, uh, Ellenberg. And in independently, just uh, with showed that uh, this is the same in f q to the n. Again, for any q, as n grows, uh, you, you have uh, you have this bound. Okay. 
So, and I'll, I'll say later, th this constant actually turns out to be uh, tight for the for a variant of this problem. You can think of the tripartite version of this, where you have three sets. Instead of one set A, you have three sets, A, B, and C. And let's say that there's a matching between them. So they have this, each set has the same number of elements. And there's this kind of matching, such that uh, each triple in the matching is an arithmetic progression but no other triple is an arithmetic progression. Okay, so if you just have one set, you can think of A, A, A as having you know, trivial progressions. As, you know, if you have A, 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 the same element is a progression of uh, direction zero. Right, so these are kind of the trivial ones, and then there are no other ones. So this, this question is the um, tripartite version, and you can ask this also. Uh, there's versions of this question that make sense also in F2 to the N. But it turns out that for this question, this is a, these are several papers that came afterwards uh, that I'll mention that uh, the, this constant is actually tight. So the proof is simple, short, and it gives the tight constant for, for this variant. Uh, so it's kind of, you can ask for much more. Um, so is all these use the polynomial method, or which, which ones? Th these use the polynomial method? And not, none of these. These don't. Okay, so the plan for the talk is the, is the following. What, what I want to show is, uh, write it here. So I want to start with the, the, the proof of uh, Ellenberg and uh, Giswit. And I'll, I think w when it first came out, it looks very, it looks like one big trick, right? This trick and that trick. And I think by now, uh, I, I'm, I think I can show it in a way that doesn't look tricky. It's like uh, maybe less, uh, less of a trick and more of a method, especially because it was used later in you know, a couple other papers for other, a little differently. So then you're starting to see that it's really not, not really a trick. So I'll try to show it in the in least uh, trick way possible. And then I want to uh, talk about some uh, connections or connections to other, other problems or extensions. Uh, so the first one is the sunflower conjecture. Uh, in combinatorics. The second one is to a uh, matrix multiplication. So this actually shows that some approaches for fast matrix multiplication uh, can't work. And then I want to show the, maybe this will get us to the break, or maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm optimistic. Then I'll show a, th a theorem of uh, Green, of uh, Ben Green, which is uh, it's a version of uh, Sarkozy's theorem in fu function fields. So whatever that is, it's, it's, it uses this technique in a, in a slightly different way to show something slightly different, which is very, it's very interesting, I think. And, and then finally, I'll, uh, show you some very easy uh, recent uh, new work on the matrix rigidity. And this, uh, this is a joint work with uh, Ben Edelman, who was an undergrad here in Princeton. So again, it's, uh, it's more like this matrix multiplication. It's, uh, it's a kind of a negative result showing that some, some uh, candidates for matrix rigidity, which is a question in, in complexity theory, can't uh, can't work somehow. So it's. What, what is matrix rigidity? I'll I'll say what it is when when we get there. It's uh, we're trying to construct matrices that are far in Hamming distance from all low rank matrices. And um, if we can find such matrices, it gives us some complexity lower bounds and uh, some. We'll sh we sh we show we can show using these techniques that some candidates that look very natural uh, actually don't work. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, all right, so yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll see everything. So, um, any questions? All right. So, oh.
So, uh, okay, so here, here's the high level idea of the, of the proof. So if A, if A is a cap set, Uh, it, it, it's equivalent to the following uh, condition. It's equivalent to saying that uh, uh, the only the only triple the, the only solution to this equation x plus z equals two y with x y z in A. The only solution is the trivial one, where x is equal to y equal to z. Right? This is basically saying that the, the only three-term progressions are the trivial ones with direction 0. Right? So if you have a, a three-term progression in any group, this is x, this is z, x plus z is going to, x plus z over 2 is y, so x plus z equals 2y. So A, A is a cap set if and only if this is this equation only have trivial solutions. And you see the proof extends to other equations where there's a trivial solution and you want to show there are no uh, uh, trivial solutions. As long as the sum of the coefficients is zero. So you can you can move the two here. As long as uh, th you have three coefficients summing to zero, the the proof will work just the same. So, okay, let me just move this here. So, what's the idea? Let's look at the matrix. So, it has uh, elements of A indexing the rows and the columns. And if I have X and, uh, let's call it Y, let me just make this Y and this is Z just to make it simpler. To have x and y, I can look at the element. Uh, so for now, let's say the entries of the matrix are elements of fq to the n. Later, we'll apply some function on them. But it's a, it's a matrix that has all the sums, right? So here's the observation. The, the key observation here is that the elements on the diagonal are disjoint from the elements in the off-diagonal. So on the diagonal, I'm getting x plus x, which is a, a, an element of the set 2a. So let me define the set 2a to be the set 2x, x in a. That's a set that has the same size as the size of a. And the diagonal will only contain elements from 2a. And the off-diagonal will only contain elements that are not in 2a, because I don't have solutions to x plus y equals 2z. Right? So there's no, it's not in 2a. OK, so I'm, I separated the diagonal from the off-diagonal, which is great, because I'm going to use some rank argument. And we know all, all of these uh, algebraic proofs you know, eventually uh, reduced to having some uh, diagonal matrix that has high rank. Right? So this is the same thing. Uh, so we're going to try to find uh, some function f from fq to the n to fq such that uh, we'll, we'll want that f is 0 on the off diagonal. So it will be 0 outside of 2a. Right, so if this is, uh, if this is fq to the n, and this is, this is 2a, we want f to be 0 here. And we want f to be uh, non-zero on, let's say, many elements let's say most of the 
see why it works. Because we need a lot of non-zeros on the diagonal. Maybe not all of them, but maybe half of them will be non-zero. Okay, so it's non-zero on a good chunk of this, and zero everywhere here. And somehow we would like f to have some property, which will come from its degree as a polynomial, that uh, the matrix uh, Uh, let's call it MF. It's the matrix that has f of x plus y. And we're, we're actually going to show this for the, the bigger matrix. So it's, it's a matrix that has uh, fq to the n times fq to the n. This has low rank. Okay, so this matrix will be a submatrix of this. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, if, if you think of this matrix, it's a linear transformation that computes the convolution uh, over the group fq to the n. If you take a vector, it's a f you think of it as a function over fq to the n, the image will be the convolution of this function with f. Um, so what's the image of f? fq. And fq to the n is the same. Yeah. I mean, I could write any field here, and the proof would still work, but I, couldn't f uh, I just couldn't find such an f. The fact that I choose fq here, and q is uh, the same q here, gives me the edge that they're actually, a if you think about it, if you know a little bit of you know, representation theory, that it's easier to find low-rank matrices uh, over a field where the field divides the size of the matrix for this kind of matrices. It's, okay. So, so th yeah, this is, uh, is going to help us. It's just we're choosing it to help us. But any, any field, if you can do this over any field, this would be fine. Um, OK, so and, and what does low here? Low is going to be about the size, that, the size of A we're shooting for. Because once we have this set up, we'll, we'll argue that A has to be, at most, the rank. Because, uh, right? because you have such a diagonal matrix uh, whose size is about A in a low rank matrix. So A cannot be much bigger than the rank. So low here would be something like c to the n, c is less than q. Uh, so, so m, this is the definition of, of, of mf, right? Is it yeah, matrix? yeah. I'm defining mf to be, this is a matrix that uh, on the entire uh, vector space. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so is it obvious once I have such a thing I'm done? Or okay? Yes. OK, no, I didn't catch that. OK, so why, why, why am I done? Because this matrix, let's give this name uh, also. Let's call this MA, OK? Uh, maybe MAF. Well, not this matrix, but the, the one where you apply F here. Uh, this is a sub-matrix of that matrix. Yes. Now, I'm going to get many non-zeros on the diagonal. That is, half of the diagonal will be non-zero. And all of the off-diagonals will be zero because of the first two conditions. So the rank of this matrix is going to be at least half of the size of A. But it's a sub-matrix of a low-rank matrix, so the size of A is at most this. Okay, so there's, you're, you're pulling the rope in from the two sides. We'll have to balance it somehow. Um, okay. So it's a uh, yeah. At least if I think if you think of it like this, it's not uh, too tricky. It's you observe something on the matrix and you're trying to use rank to to get the bound, which is it's not uh, different than a lot of other proofs in combinatorics. Okay. So we'll, we'll do this. Uh, so again, the, the, um, the, 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 the parameter that will give us the third one will be the degree of f. And um, we'll see. And there's something very nice that happens there with the degree. So let's, let's, uh, we're going to separate this uh, task into two. So the, we'll have two lemmas. The first one is an interpolation lemma, which will give us one and two. 
saying that uh, for any set A, you can find the poly polynomial of so-and-so degree with the first two properties, right? And uh, that's the kind of standard interpolation counting you know, dimensions. And the third uh, one will come from another lemma, which is the kind of low rank lemma. So let's start. The first one, we'll call it the interpolation lemma. This will give 1 and 2. So <coughs> we're going to define some quantity that will be useful. Let's call it uh, C n q d. This is going to be the uh, number of monomials uh, for polynomials in, in uh, over f q to the n. The number of monomials of degree at most d. So let me just say first what this is. This is going to be the number of uh, tuples j1 up to jn such that each ji is an integer, integer between 0 and q minus 1 and the sum ji that goes from 1 to n is at most d. So this is equal to the number of monomials of degree at most d in fq x1 xn. So this is the ring of polynomials in n variables of fq. You notice that uh, this condition where each, each variable cannot appear with degree bigger than q minus 1 is just because uh, over fq x to the q is x. So you can always represent uh, you can represent any function. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll uh, yeah maybe maybe this is the the time to to, to say it. Uh, um, you can represent an, any function the, the set of functions from f q to the n to f q. This is a vector space of dimension q to the n. Uh, this is the same as uh, polynomials uh, in fq uh, with, let's call it individual degrees. most q minus 1. So any function you can, for any function you can find a polynomial where it individual degrees at most q minus 1 that agrees with this function and vice versa. And, and the reason is just the dimensions are the same. The dimension is q to the n. So this just generalizes the kind of well-known fact that over the Boolean cube uh, all the polynomials, you can only work with uh, multilinear polynomials. For example, so over f q, you have to allow the degrees to each variable to have degree at most q minus one, and this thing is just the dimension of the subspace where the total degree is bounded by d, right? So we just draw draw a picture here. Uh, okay, so. This, this number, th th let me just write here. So we can define this to be uh, at most d. And then if I write equal, then I just write equal here. All right. So th this is the dimension of monomials of degree exactly d. This behaves in a very nice way. So it's going to be 
So first of all, d, d is between 0 and q minus 1 n, right? Because that's the that's maximum degree you can have here. Uh, most of the monomials will be somewhere in the middle, q minus 1 n over 2. And then there's a sharp kind of drop once you go away from this. Remember, q, q is, a f is fixed and n goes to infinity. That's, this is where we're going to use that. We have this concentration of monomials in the middle. Okay, so if you, if, if you cut it somewhere here where, let's say, it's some, other, some constant bigger than half, then you, then you get this kind of uh, exponential decay. This is where it's going to come from. OK. So, so this is the kind of the setup for the interpolation lemma. Now let me s tell you what, uh, what it is. So, so the, I can't quite explain it in my class. So the, yeah. the CQ is number, these are the coefficients. Of the, what are those? The, these are the exponents. The, so each, each tuple corresponds to a monomial uh, x1 to the j1, x2 to the j2 xn to the jn. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So these are the set of powers. All right. Like maybe. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. So let's call it again lemma one, the interpolation lemma. Uh, if, if the size of A or half the size of A is at least Q to the N minus CN Q most D. Then there exists uh, f of degree at most d such that f of a complement is 0 and 2. f is non zero on at least a over two elements in A. So, so this is what we wanted from the first part. Now we're going to use this when D is close to the right side. We're going to use this when D is, uh, uh, let's write it here. Let's say when D is something like one minus epsilon Q minus one n. And some, this is the graph of exactly this. So if I look at it mostly, I'm summing, I'm integrating everything almost up to the end. So what is this going to be? Okay, asymptotically. Q to the n minus the tail. Yeah, which is pretty small. Yeah. But we'll have to look at this uh, right, for some alpha, right? Alpha less than one. Actually, this alpha will go to zero. Uh, sorry, it will go to one as epsilon goes to zero, right? So the large deviations. Uh, it's not very hard to show. Uh, okay, so we'll be interested in this. This will be. We'll have to play with this q to the alpha and. Uh, to get the size of A exactly, but uh, so we're going to use, eventually we're going to use this lemma in that setting. So saying that A is at least Q to the N minus this, right? think of this as Q to the N minus Q to the alpha. We're basically saying the size of A is at least Q to the alpha N. So A, A fits in the tail, right? So if A fits in the tail, we can find a polynomial that vanishes on the complement of A. Sorry, if A doesn't fit in the tail, if A is bigger than the, the tail, 
the complement of A will fit in the everything up to the tail. So you can find the polynomial of degree D that will vanish on the complement. Let's uh, right, if, if A or if A half doesn't fit in here, then the complement of A has to fit in here if you sum all of these. So you can, there's enough degrees of freedom here to interpolate something that vanishes on the complement. So that's, that's the idea. I can just, uh, uh, just write, write the proof. And, and the fact that y you're taking this slack kind of half is just so because you don't just want something that vanishes on the complement and doesn't vanish somewhere on A. You want it to not vanish on at least, say, half the elements. So, so you need some, some slack. So, so here's the proof. Uh, so let, let's call it P, uh, PD be the vector space of uh, degree at most <coughs> d polynomials. So this, the dimension of this space is going to be kind of what's on the left here. Uh, so the dimension, by our assumption, Right. By, by this assumption, this is the dimension of PD. It's going to be at most. Uh, it's going to be at least uh, q to the n minus half of a. Now we're going to take. Uh, let's consider. Uh, PD and intersect it with a set of all uh, all f such that the support of f is contained in A. So this is just the set where f is non-zero. So this is also a vector space, right? To get this vector space, the the co-dimension is the size of uh, sorry. Uh, is the size of A complement, right? So support of F is the set where F is non-zero. Okay, so basically, I'm looking at all F that are supported on A. To this subspace is, is, is achieved by uh, Q to the N minus size of A equations, right? You want all the zeros outside of A. So the dimension of this. So I'm s I start with PD, yeah, so it's at least the dimension of PD min minus the number of equations that I need to get this thing. So this will be Q to the N minus A. It's just linear algebra. I start with some subspace and I add this many equations. That's, that's as much as the dimension is going to drop. It's not going to drop. It can't drop by more than that. That's true for any. Yes, there'll be. What functions defined only on A and go to the field? And no, I'm, I'm represented by a degree equal nominal. Not really. Uh, oh, these are, yes, these are functions. Yeah, these are degree D functions supported on A. Yes. No, these are functions that have to be zero everywhere else. You're not ignoring everything else, they have to be zero everywhere else. OK, but the dimension of PD is at least this. So this is at least, uh, this is at least half A. OK? So again, we're looking at all degree D functions vanishing outside of A. And this subspace has dimension at least half of A. 
So there has to be at least one function here whose support is half of a. If you have a vector space of dimension k, there has to be a vector with k non-zeros. Okay, that's, that's an easy exercise. So that's, this completes the proof. Right. There's nothing more than count, counting them. This is the polynomial method, kind of uh, the, the, the simplest form of it. You, you have a set, and you want to find a polynomial that vanishes on it. So you count the uh, number of monomials. And if you have enough monomials, you can do it. In this case, the uh, it's weird because the set is the complement of a small set. So it's actually, it's almost everything. So you're working with degrees that are almost kind of all the way to the end. So it seems suspicious because I, I'm, I told you later that we're going to use this degree to show that the rank is small. But the degree is so high, how, how can it possibly give low rank matrices? Right, so, so that's the second lemma. I already see that uh, yeah, it's probably not going <laughs> to get very far. but. Good. Uh, okay, so everybody's okay with this? Here's the second lemma. This is the low rank lemma. And this was already in the Kurtlev, uh, Kurtlev Park paper. And this also, this lemma kind of appears in the, some of the applications kind of just by itself, because it's, it's, a, it's an amazing observation, and it's amazing nobody used it before. Uh, which is no, nobody saw how useful it is before. Um, so here's the lemma. So suppose f is of degree most d then the rank of mf which is just recall this is the matrix that has f of x plus y so it's q to the n by q to the n matrix uh, the rank is at most so if I wrote d here, that would not be very surprising, right? But also not very useful. But it's actually uh, d over 2. Uh, and there's a 2 here. So this, this 2 is not going to change much. But this 2 will change uh, a lot. Because uh, it will take us from, uh, from here, from 1 minus epsilon, to half minus epsilon or half minus epsilon over 2. Right? So just to see why, uh, yeah, let me. This is degree d polynomial, and I'm bounding the rank by counting the number of monomials of degree d over 2. And again, multiplying by 2. So if, if d was. Uh, 1 minus epsilon times the maximum. This is d. Then d over 2 is uh, half minus epsilon over 2, q minus 1n, which is already uh, on the other side of the expectation. And so you're going from almost everything to almost nothing. Okay. Again, the, the proof is, uh, is a few lines. Uh, so, right, we want to write uh, uh, f of x plus y. How do you show the matri this matrix has low rank? You want to write this as a sum of products of functions of x and a function of y without using too many products. Right. Uh, a rank 1 matrix is a function of x times a function of y. Then you just you want to sum 
these kind of expressions without using too many uh, summons. OK, so let's, uh, let's write this in some, so basically write f in some uh, expansion. And let's, let's write it this way. So there's some coefficient, c alpha, x plus y to the alpha. So alpha will be the right, alpha 1 up to alpha n, the, kind of the exponent. And this, is, this just says that we're summing over all monomials up to degree d. There's some coefficient, and then we take x plus y to the alpha. So this will be you know, x1 plus y1 to the alpha 1, x2 plus y2 to the alpha 2, and so on. Okay, that's just some polynomial. And now you can open the parentheses right, and completely uh, write this uh, kind of open all the, so just, just write it as a sum of monomials in x and in y. right? And the observation is that in each monomial, uh, either uh, x has degree at most d over 2 or y has degree d over 2. They can't both have degree. Uh, more than d over 2. So right, in each monomial, uh, either the degree of x is at most d over 2, or the degree in y is at most d over 2. So I can write this. Uh, I can group. I can group terms according to uh, x and then according to y, and I'll get two different sums. Uh, the first sum I'm going to take all the monomials that have degree of x at most d over two. So I'm going to sum over all all uh, exponents up to uh, degree d over two. It'll be some uh, coefficient. I oh, know a alpha x to the alpha, and then some function. Let's call it g alpha of y. Because in, any mono in every monomial where this is the degree of x, I'm going to group together all the whatever appears in y. Okay, But this is not everything. I have to also take care of the ones that satisfy this condition and not this condition. So I'll have another sum. And better to most over 2. Um, coefficient y to the beta h beta of x. Okay. So in each sum and here is uh, f degree uh, is rank one matrix, and I'm summing. Uh, I have two sums, and each one has this number of uh, of summits. So that's the that's why the rank is low. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yes, we'll use the lemma for, for 2a. It's the same size. Yeah. Uh, oh. You want mf to be no, you want f to, to be non zero. You really care about the complement of 2a or on the entire space the or just on the subset? No, just on the entire space. But is it enough to have it on the subset? Uh, maybe it's enough to have it on. For the argument? Uh, I mean, it may be not easy. Uh, well, it will <laughs> it will have to be non-zero on a plus a intersect comp uh, intersect uh, the complement of two a. But a plus a could be any everything. That's the problem. Right? The 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 off diagonal entries is sum. It sums of elements in a. Uh, a set this large, a set this large, the sum set could be, uh, it, the sum set could be very large. But you're right. If you know it's for some reason the a plus a is not very large, you can maybe gain something. Because the, as long as the complement of two a in the sum set a plus a is yeah. zero, the argument will still yeah. give you a yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of a matrix. So yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So just. Uh, uh, Putting things together, let me just uh, sh tell you what, what constant do you get out of this, putting these two things together. Then we'll take a, a short break. Uh, 
they're putting things together. Again, the, the pic picture uh, is worth uh, kind of a thousand uh, words. So for the interpolation lemma to work, we needed, uh, we needed A or half A to be bigger than this. Right. Then we're applying the rank bound. We jump to D over 2. Right. This, is, this is the degree D kind of slice. And this will be the degree D over 2 slice. But then to get a contradiction, we need that the rank of the matrix will be too low. So we need that the size of A, again, size of A half should be uh, less, than, less than this area. Right? This is going to be the rank. And we're going to say by contradiction, the, the rank is at least half A. So, right. so what uh, D will we choose? Two thirds, right? Because we want these two things to be the same. So we'll take d to be two thirds u minus one n. D over two is one third q minus one n. These two areas are the same by symmetry. And and the bound on a that you get, so putting things together, you get again. I can with this picture, it's an easy uh, exercise. You get that the the size of a. Uh, is at most uh, some constant, maybe 4 or 2 times C n q, uh, 1 third q minus 1 n. So you get that the size of A is the number of tuples uh, uh, j1 up to jn such that each ji is between 0 and q minus 1, and the sum is at most 1 third q minus 1 n. And I claim that this is at most c to the n, where c is less than q. And if you had to compute this constant, what would you do? Yeah. Anybody? No, so actually, there's an it's an entropy maximization thing. Uh, it's a Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution on a finite number of states. It's a, it's a headache. It, it, you don't get anything nice, but you can compute it. It's, uh, it's the maximum entropy of a distribution uh, that has uh, Q states, 0, 1, 2, up to Q minus 1. And this expectation is at most uh, this. And so you take this entropy, and this is like, this is going to be e, e to this entropy. And it's, uh, and it's uh, less than, Q. so the entropy is less than log Q. And we have to show that it's a constant uh, bounded. It's bounded from log Q, and uh, so e to, e to the entropy is less than Q. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a dual, uh, but, uh, and, and as I said before, this and turns out to be tight for the tripartite version. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of uh, amazing, I think. All right, so any qu uh, questions? Well, if you prove it uh, for the non-tripartite case, only for the non-tripartite case, then it can't work for the, And I ever think this is probably this is probably tight. Uh, all right. <coughs> so uh, that's like f a five-minute break, and uh, that uh, if someone uh, showed this result on CAPSET, it would imply the this really nice conjecture. Let me just tell you, tell you what it is. It's the the, the sunflower conjecture. Uh, well, that, there are two sunflower conjectures. Uh, 
So first, what, what's a sunflower? A sunflower is an, uh, an arrangement of uh, three sets, uh, A, B, C, such that uh, sets, uh, such that the intersections, uh, the pairwise intersections are all the same. That's a th sunflower. Um, you can generalize this to k sunflowers with k sets, but uh, we'll, we'll stick to three. So for example, uh, it can be something that uh, looks like this. Or you can even just take three disjoint sets. That's also a, a legal uh, sunflower. <laughs> uh, and the, the original sun sunflower conjecture, this is the it's called conjecture one of uh, Erdős and Radu. From from sixty, so this has a thousand dollars price. Uh, is that uh <coughs> if you have a family of sets, uh, and any family of sets. Family of sets, each of size k, with at least uh, c to the k sets. So there exists c. Uh, contains a sunflower. So th this is the conjecture. If there's some constant c, such that if you have any family of sets in any universe, if every set is of size k, and there are at least c to the k sets, then there you will find the sunflower there. So of course, th these examples are important, because uh, otherwise you can just take uh, <laughs> all the sets to be disjoint. So this is still open. Uh, what's, what's known, what was showed by Erdos and, and Radu? Uh, Excuse me? Each set is of size k. Is that k elements? K, yeah, k elements. You have sets. Sets have, uh, the only thing sets have is their size, right? So it's nothing else. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, you have some universe, right? Uh, you can assume it's finite because uh, we're talking about finite numbers. So you have a large, large family, uh, sets of integers, whatever. So this is for three petals, yeah. For more than that, I'm not sure. Uh, what's known is uh, a weaker bound of uh, k factorial times two to the k. Yeah. I think the conjecture is that there's a, for, ev for every number of petals, there'll be some c, uh, depending on that. So what's known is that if you, have, if you have at least this number of sets, then you have a sunflower. And the, the gap is, is that's still open. And uh, so there's another sunflower conjecture. Uh, <laughs> it's called conjecture two uh, by uh, Erdos and Zemeredi. From uh, 78 which says, OK, let's just look at sets, uh, <coughs> sets of integers between 1 and n. So, uh, so if you have a family of, uh, of subsets of the inter integers from 1 to n, With at least uh, uh, c to the n members, 
pair of sets. C is less is some constant less than two. <coughs> must contain a sum for. So here we, we limit the universe to be the integers from 1 to n. So there are at most 2 to the n sets. And the conjecture is that if you have a, a family of sets that's uh, relatively small, so c to the n for a constant c less than 2, some constant c, then what? Is this yeah, yeah. Is this the, the conjecture is that, again, there exists c less than 2, yep. uh, such that if you have such a family, wh when you hit this bound, you must contain a sum for. So it's very similar to the cap set thing. Uh, no, <laughs> I, don't th I don't think so. Uh, so this was also open, and, and it was known that uh, conjecture 1 implies conjecture 2. And uh, then there, there was a paper of uh, uh, Umans, uh, sorry, Alon, Spilke, and Umans in uh, 2013, showing that uh, kind of the cap set conjecture, or at the time it was a conjecture, what we just saw, uh, saw uh, the theorem <coughs> uh, implies <coughs> conjecture too. So now this is a theorem. Uh, yeah. Uh, is is so now the domain is 1 to n. Over there, there's no domain. He, here, k is the size of the sets. And there, yeah, there is a k uniform hypergraph over arbitrary domain, and here is over a domain of size. Right, n. right. I mean, most sets here will have size roughly n over 2. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's a different so question. So it's not a uniform hypergraph now. No, now the sets are any, 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 any size. Any Yeah. And so Once you're almost there, you have to contain okay. this structure. OK. So this, uh, again, th this, this paper uh, showed that this implies this. The proof was a bit complicated, uh, not very direct. There's a more recent uh, kind of half-page reduction by uh, uh, Naslund and Sawin. The, the original proof didn't give uh, the constant somehow. It was just that there exists a constant if there exists a constant there. This proof is a direct reduction that gives you a quantitative bound. And actually, uh, this is very simple. So again, as I said in the beginning, I, I just because I want to talk about everything, I'll, I, I'll skip the proofs now. And at the end, you can uh, ask me to show proofs of uh, whatever you want to see. So I can show this in the, again, this is very can simple. It's, a, it's an amazing exercise. If you can figure it out, the reduction, it's, it's really pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a reduction. You, you take the sets and you embed them uh, somehow in, in F3, but it's not, yeah, it's like a gadget. Uh, OK. So why would you think conjecture 1 is true? What? Why would one think that conjecture 1 Because you're er erdish. I don't know. <laughs> they just know things. <laughs> It's it's a, it's a it's a, it might be wrong. I mean, uh, I don't. I mean, what are the maybe the exam the examples are just. Right, right. Every three sets have to intersect. Yes. So it limits the it limits the universe somehow. Yeah. So. I mean. Well, if, if you try to string them together, at some point, they'll, they won't intersect. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 No, I'm not an expert on this conjecture. I'm sure there's, there's been enough time that you know, people wrote, I'm sure, a lot of them. I'm sure there are good insights to this that I don't have. But uh, it's definitely uh, it's known this implies, too. So it's, it's a stronger conjecture. Uh, OK, so that was just a, it's, it's a cute thing to, to know. If you, it's a famous conjecture. Now it's, it's, a, it's proved. Uh, so what's the connection to matrix multiplication? So uh, you know, without going into too many details, I'm sure most of you have heard of this, is uh, if I have two n by n matrices, and I want to multiply them, this is a and b. Yeah. What's the best? That's for this? 
k factorial 2 to the k. Yeah. Well, so if I want to multiply two matrices, uh, it's a computational problem, and the, the difficulty is, is measured in how many multiplications I'm making. Just say additions are cheap, yeah, easy, not important. So I'm counting multiplications. So the, the trivial thing is to multiply row by row. That's n multiplications. Then you have to repeat this for n, n squared times. So the trivial is uh, n cubed multiplications. And uh, I'm sure all of you know that you can do better than this, starting with uh, Strassen's work and many, many, many uh, other works. The, the best uh, upper bound today is uh, n to the Here it is. 237, uh, 2.3729 by uh, Virginia Williams. Um, but the, the, the throughout the years, since the I think 60s or 70s, uh, there have been various combinatorial conjectures such that you know, if this conjecture holds, you get uh, exponent 2. You cannot do better than 2, because there are n, n squared outputs. Um, so w w one of these uh, one of these conjectures was by a co Copper Smith and uh, Vinograd in 1990. Uh, from 1990, it's a, it's a conjecture that that's been around for a while. And if if it were if uh, it was to be true, then you would get immediately an n squared uh, algorithm. And this cap set result shows it's, uh, it's false. Uh, so let me just tell you what the conjecture is. Uh, and it, 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 it also, I mean, there are more recent conjecture that it also uh, shows are false. So here's the conjecture. Conjecture is that you can find a sequence of groups, sequence of uh, abelian groups. Uh, just call it G, but it's think of it as a sequence for every in, in increasing sequence of groups and uh, subsets. So for every group, there's a subset such that there are no three disjoint. subsets A, B, C in S with the same volume. So the volume is uh, sum A in A, A, sum Okay. First, finish writing it, and then we'll, we'll parse it. And the size of S should grow quicker than C log G. So, it should go quicker quicker than C log G for any for any constant C. So, in uh, asymptotic notations, it's big. It's little omega of log G. So, here's the conjecture. You can find for, uh, groups as large as you want and with special sets S, such that the set S has this property that no three disjoint subsets of S have the same volume. These are volumes, not sums of elements. Or well, sums of elements, I define this as the volume. <laughs> oh. I, I, this is just how they call it. It's a discrete. Right it's a discrete group. It's uh, it's not. There's no. Uh, it's, a, it's a sum. So, this is called uh, this property. This property is called the uh, no three disjoint 
equi voluminous sets property. <laughs> and this is the no three disjoint equi voluminous set conjecture. <laughs> uh, okay. So you want to find large groups with large sets such that in these sets, no three subsets, disjoint subsets, have the same volume. And the uh, ambient set, the S, has to grow quicker than log G. If you can find such a sequence, you get uh, exponent 2 for matrix multiplication. If, if you could do this, you can find uh, for any abelian group. It's whatever groups you want. If you, could do it, if you can find such a construction, you get the exponent 2. Right? And you don't have to grow very large, right? It's just a, a tiny bit more than log. Uh, if you think of it, log, log is easy, right? Take the basis of a vector space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so this is false now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is false. And this is, this is a really, really easy reduction from uh, the sunflower conjecture. So um, this was shown by, uh, again, Al Alon, Spirke, and Umans. And uh, the, the reduction here is, is kind of, uh, it's so simple, I, uh, I'll show it now. So if, uh, um, so the, you, c you can always find, if you had such a construction, right, you can always find uh, Two to the s over g uh, subsets of s with the same with the same volume, just because there's, there's only g options for the volume. Right, so inside s, you can find this many uh, things with the same volume, and this is at least. Uh, if they have this big C here, and you calculate it, this is at least 2 to the 1 minus 1 over C S. So if the sunflower conjecture, which we now know this conjecture 2 is true, uh, then there exists a sunflower. There exists a sunflower among the things of the same volume. So if it's a disjoint sunflower, then you're done. Otherwise, you have something that looks like this. Right? You have three sets with the same intersection, and each set has the same volume. So what do you do? You throw away the middle. It's a billion, so okay. So <laughs> this is just—it's uh, very cute. But but then okay, there's there are more uh, modern ap approaches for uh, exponent two matrix multiplication. One of the most uh, ambitious one. Uh, is a sequence of papers by Kohn and Umans. And they have various conjectures. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it. it uh, they're in, uh, some, somewhat in, in this uh, s similar some to this, but also the, the much more complicated, not just groups. You can look at more general uh, structures. And there's a paper that came out after the Ellenberg just uh, with result, a uh, paper of um, Blasiak, Church, Korn, Grochow, Naslund, Sawin, and Umans, which basically picks apart all these conjectures. And uh, th they show that uh, if you take the strongest possible, co uh, the, the most general conjecture in the Korn Umans kind of program, uh, you can also use these methods of, from CAPSET with more work. You can use to falsify these conjectures for some groups, so for groups with bounded exponent. But so it, it doesn't rule out the entire approach, uh, but it rules out a lot, uh, a lot of groups. Uh, so that's uh, why. It has to grow faster than c log g for any constant c. Has to grow. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, well, actually, yeah. If it has to be little omega, just little omega, yeah. So this is uh, something that came out. So the, the sunflower and matrix multiplication were kind of known to be related to CAPSET, and these are things that came out uh, right after. Uh, the next thing I wanted to, to mention, are there any questions on this? So, so, so that means that this, there doesn't seem to be much of a program yet. 
uh, for improving that bound? Is that what you're saying? Well, the, the Kahneman's program, uh, this rules out the groups of bounded exponent. But there are groups of uh, unbounded exponents. So it, it, uh, um, it points the research or the effort into more limited uh, direction. Or, uh, Would it be useful, though, if it's on habit? Met uh, expon yeah, exponent two yeah. matrix multiplication that would yeah. be useful. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's safe to say. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the biggest questions in complexity. Uh, it would be useful in practice, I think, if it's well, if the constants are good. But yeah. it's one of those basic complexity results that uh, we we want to know the answer. I mean, it'll be more interesting if it's not two. I think, but uh, <laughs> okay. So, any other questions before we switch? Uh, okay, so, so now I want to mention, uh, talk about Green's uh, paper, which is uh, really uh, interesting. I think. I think what's interesting about it is uh, a lot of it is, is the proof, which I think, unfortunately, I. Maybe I can show a sketch of it. Uh, but here's the um, here's the result. Here, so the the pa the paper is uh, it's called the uh, Sarkozy's theorem in function fields. We'll see what, what it is. So this Sarkozy's theorem in final field is going to be a corollary of what I'll write here. This, this is a more general theorem. Um, okay. So let f, f q gamma n, f q to the n. Uh, so gamma is less than one. B uh, degree D map. So it's a po it's a polynomial map from gamma n. Let's say gamma is one over ten something. From a s slightly smaller space to a bigger space, where each each coordinate of the map is a polynomial of degree at most d. And we need we need some condition that's it's not crucial. You can get away without it, but uh, uh, you want the the size. So f minus one of zero is the set of elements that map to zero. You want it to, to have only one element. Okay. So you want the preimage of zero to be to have one element. If it's bigger, you can actually reduce to this case very easily by kind of in intersecting with hyperplanes and so on. But uh, let's just say you have this, so the gamma will become smaller. But let's say for some gamma you have this condition. Uh, then, so there exists a constant epsilon, which depends only on d. So now d is a think of d as a constant. It's a constant degree map. Uh, so degree 2 or 3. So there's a constant depending on the degree and on gamma. Such that uh, if A is a subset of FQ to the N with the size at least Q to the 1 minus epsilon N, so it's a sufficiently large subset here, uh, if you look at A, a minus A intersect the image of F. Then I know zero will be here, right? Uh, because some, uh, zero is in the image, and zero is here. So the theorem says that there's a non-zero element. So this is uh, this is not just zero. There's at least one. One more 
Basically, there are two elements in A that are different, whose difference is in the image of F. So it's, again, it's this kind of density theorem. If you have a large enough set, you have some structure. And in this case, the structure is it's very general. Take any constant degree map from, let's say, gamma is a constant, from you know, a linear number of variables to n. If a is large enough, there will be two elements whose difference is in the image. Uh, so what is, what is uh, the application? So what is Sarkozy's theorem? It's just a corollary is that uh, if you have a set A, so this is the this is the set of uh, univariate polynomials. Of uh, of degree at most n over F Q. Okay, so if you have a set of polynomials. Uh, who, who are all of the great most n in one variable t of uh, size at least. So I'm just right here n minus 1. So the size of this is q to the n of size at least q to the 1 minus epsilon n, where epsilon depends on uh, Q. Sorry, on, depends on Q and K. I'll say what K is in a second. Then there exist uh, two polynomials, say a, a T and B T, in A, such that A T minus B T is the kth power. And F doesn't have to be in A. So basically, if you have enough polynomials, you can find two that whose difference is a kth power. Again, K is some constant. And, and this is also true. So, so Sarkozy's theorem is uh, this theorem over the integers. You can integers from 1 to n. If you have enough integers, you can find two whose difference is a kth power. And this tells you that uh, I mean, instead of integers, you look at univariate polynomials, which is essentially fq to the n, then uh, you get it much faster. You get it here, q to the constant times n. Where over the integers, you need something like q to the n over n. So. Um, and the proof is just uh, using that theorem. You just look at uh, the map sending. Uh, well, I, I, that's unfortunate choice of, of letters. Uh, let's call it uh, H. So just you define F to send H to H to the K, where gamma is uh, right, n over K. You take a polynomial. And you take its power, so it's a pol it's a polynomial map. The coefficient, if you write it as a basis of coefficients, uh, it will be a degree k map. So that's just, it's a very simple application. But you can think of other applications. You can think of uh, sets of matrices where you want a pair of matrices to have a difference whose uh, <coughs> who has the form uh, you know a a transpose for rank R matrix. So, so <laughs> some, something, think of any, any, the image of any polynomial map of constant degree. That's a very rich, uh, um, it's a very rich thing to use. So you can always uh, get stuff whose differences in there. And, and the proof is, uh, again, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit long, but maybe just the, the big idea is that you look at, uh, uh, look at AA and F of X minus Y, where X and Y are elements in A. Uh, sorry, this will not be this F. This function will be, let's call it phi, where phi of uh, Z is the size of the pre-image of Z. So you define this function, 
it's a function that takes uh, output integers. And you look at a matrix that has a, a, and the value of this function on the difference x minus y. The diagonal is uh, 0. So when you apply this function, you get 1. And the off diagonal will be 0. If, if the theorem is not true, then you get zeros, because uh, <coughs> you miss the image. Right? So this, this, this matrix will have high, the rank of this matrix will be the size of A. This is just the identity matrix. If A doesn't contain, if you assume by contradiction that A minus A doesn't intersect the image, this will be the identity matrix. And then the, ma the only interesting part of the proof is to show that this weird function has degree, uh, which is slightly less than the maximal degree. So again, using the low rank lemma, this will have very low rank. And uh, that's not very hard. It's, just, it's a calculation. Uh, but it's, it's surprising that this this function will have a uh, degree. I mean, you can take uh, fq to be q to be 2 here, even. Uh, you can define this function, and uh, it will have degree, you know, 1 minus epsilon n, where epsilon depends on uh, only on the degree of f and on gamma. So it's still in the right course to show that this, this has degree. Yeah. This has degree bounded away from the maximum. Well, it's not, it's not that hard. Uh, OK. Uh, all right, good. So all right, good. So I have uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes. Maybe I'll, I'll show the matrix rigidity uh, uh, application. definition <coughs> of rigidity. So a matrix, uh, let's call it an n by n matrix, A. That, so there are two parameters, R and S. So a matrix is RS rigid if uh, oh, 1 needs to change at least s entries of a to reduce its rank It's a matrix that's far in Hamming distance from all low rank matrices. That's an RS rigid matrix. And why do we. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the rigidity of matrices uh, as ma in metric space where. No, it's not this geometric rigidity, geometric graph rigidity. No, no, no. It's nothing, absolutely nothing to do. There are, there are many rigidity. Um, Yeah, there's really no nothing, uh, nothing in common with that problem, which is a, another problem that I like a lot. But uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so wh why do we care? So Valiant showed in the in the seventies that uh, so basically, if A is uh, so R will need to be something like n over log log n, and s will need to be something slightly superlinear. Let's say for some epsilon, if, if you have such a matrix, then uh, to just say you get a lower bound, 
a computational complexity lower bound for computing the map uh, x goes to ax. So it's a mapping from wh whatever field you're on. So now f, f can be any field. It can be complex numbers, finite fields. You have a linear map, and you want to compute it. Uh, what th the specific lower bound is uh, not very important. It's, it's a lower bound that we don't know how to prove for any reasonable. Uh, it's a super linear size circuit uh, um, with logarithmic depth. That, it's not very important. It's, it's, a, it's a barrier to complexity research for over 40 uh, years. Let's just say it's, it'll be uh, amazing to show uh, this kind of lower bound. Uh, so, okay, so what's the problem? If you think about it for uh, 10 minutes, you'll see that if you take a random matrix, uh, it will be much more rigid than this. Uh, actually, if you take a random 0, 1 matrix over F2, you will need to change uh, something close to n squared entries to get the rank even below half. It's not, it's not very hard to show that. Uh, so yeah, n squared over over finite fields, it's uh, n squared over log n, I think, and over over the reals, it's even better than that. <laughs> it's a constant. It's a constant n, n squared. Uh, but yeah, it will be much 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 better than this. Let's say n to the 1.5 and n over 2 here is 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 trivial. So what's the problem? Uh, with all these complexity lower bounds things, we know uh, random functions are hard, but we want to find explicit examples, and that's the challenge here is to come up with an explicit matrix. Uh, or, or sick, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I'm look. I'm looking for. Okay, what does explicit means? Uh, explicit means I want for every n, I want to, you to tell me uh, what is the matrix. What is an n by n? Maybe not for every n, but for a, a growing sequence of uh, integers, uh, for growing sizes. I want a family of matrices that has a succinct description. If you want to be completely uh, formal about this. Let's fix a finite field. I give you n. You're allowed to run in polynomial time in n and output the matrix. That's explicit. Okay. That's a formal definition of explicit for me. Uh, what? Coding constructions. Uh, Error correcting codes is actually a res uh, I, I observed and someone else wrote it. Uh, uh, Goldach and Tal uh, uh, Goldach uh, wrote a note about it. That, that th there are codes that are not rigid. <laughs> you, you can uh, tie your hands and. Okay, so uh, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> uh, okay, so what are the candidates that you would uh, try to think? What's the first candidate? Uh, well, there's a few. <laughs> uh, no, tell me, maybe you'll surprise me. Maybe you, do binary or, uh, you could do over the reals, complex numbers. What do you, what, uh, what do you want? Yeah. Really? On the diagonal? Yeah. Well, then you can change. I mean, you, you'll, you just change the diagonal. That's less than n. Yeah, diagonal, a sparse matrix will not work. Yeah. You need at least this number of entries. Otherwise. It has to be exactly that rigid, not less than that. No, no, no. Uh, what do you mean less than that? I, I want the, dis the Hamming distance to the low rank matrices to be at least something. Oh, I want it to be oh. far from low rank. Oh, I see. Yeah. Any, any good candidates? That's Read Solomon codes. Uh, good, that's a good idea. So read Solomon code, basically, if you think about it, it's a van der Munde matrix over a finite field. It's a good, I think it's a good candidate. Yes, probably. It's a big, uh, uh, polynomially large finite field, probably. Um, what about the Hadamard matrix? Yeah. Two by n by two to the n matrix over the reals with plus minus ones according to the inner products mod two. Okay, so that was con considered to be a, a good candidate for many, many years until last year. Uh, Alman and Williams uh, showed uh, that the Hadamard is not rigid. And so it's, it's, not, it's not rigid enough for this. So actually, for any epsilon, you can change n to the 1 plus epsilon entries and get the rank to n to the 1 minus epsilon prime. You can get much better below this. Uh, it's a huge surprise. 
And the proof has nothing to do with the cap set. However, uh, what we observed with uh, Ben Edelman is that you, you can use the cap set to show this uh, for many other matrices. Um, but basically, the, the, the new result that I wanted to, to tell you about is that they, um, there are a lot more matrices uh, that are related to the Hadamard, but are also uh, not rigid. Uh, so again, it's bad, uh, more bad news. Uh, <laughs> so here's the theorem. Again, that's uh, with uh, Ben Edelman. And it's, again, it's a very, very simple observation, but uh, it's still surprising is that you take, uh, take any function f uh, for an, any finite field fq. Uh, if you take any function from fq to the n to fq, then uh, the matrix uh, mf, which we saw before, so again, it's a q to the n by q to the n. So again, this n is now q to the n. Uh, is not, uh, so got it, q to the 1 minus epsilon prime n, q to the 1 plus epsilon n. So what I'm saying is that for every epsilon there exists epsilon prime such that you can change this many entries and get the rank below this. And these matrices are, so this is a subspace of a lot of matrices. It's a, it's a subspace of dimension q to the n. Uh, and it turns out that for, for, for these complexity applications, uh, it's actually enough to find such a subspace to get the complexity application. So people looked at uh, a lot of these type of kind of families of matrices. So for example, you can look at all cyclic matrices, all, uh, all matrices where you fix the first row and then you shift, shift the rows to get all, uh, all, all the cyclic shifts. Um, so essentially, if you can, if you can show that uh, in such an ensemble, in such a vector space, one of the matrices is rigid, you still get the complexity lower bounds that you're after. Because you can uh, think of a circuit computing uh, with two sets of inputs. One fixes the matrix, and the other fixes the x. So somehow, if this has a small circuit, then all of the family has small circuits. So Th these kind of constructions were kind of the hope to actually get some circuit lower bounds by saying that, OK, we don't have to show it for an explicit one. We, it's enough to show it for an explicit subspace of matrices. So this shows an example of such a subspace that looks like it should contain rigid matrices, but it uh, doesn't. Um, and this is also a bit related to the Hadamard matrix, but it's a bit hard to see, but uh, let me just mention it. So. Uh, so if I replace this with a C, look at the same ensemble of matrices, then these are all uh, simultaneously diagonalizable. <laughs> and the matrix and the basis in which they're diagonalizable is the Hadamard. Uh, it's the generalization of Hadamard with using roots of, uni roots of unity of order Q, if Q is prime. Uh, so if Q is 2, and you replace this with C, and you actually get that all these matrices are diagonalizable by Hadamard. And it's not hard to, sh to show that kind of the rigidity, if you have such a matrix that diagonalizes a lot of other matrices, uh, its rigidity is, is related to the rigidity of kind of the worst rigidity in that family. So there's some connection. And, and I don't know, initially I was hoping that you can maybe reprove this Almond Williams result using the CAPSA techniques, but it's, it's still not really. Uh, uh, working, but uh, anyway, that's the, maybe, yeah, one minute to say how this goes. So the, the, the proof is just observing that if you look at the first uh, row of this matrix, uh, it's, a it, it's just the values of this function, right? So you take a polynomial of degree uh, 1 minus epsilon q minus 1 n, and you try to approximate it with this polynomial. Take the best, the best approximation out of all of these polynomials. And as, as we saw, you can, the dimension of the space is so large, you can approximate almost anything up to a small number of errors, exponentially small number of errors. Uh, so this is this epsilon n. 
And once you have this smaller good approximation on the first row, when you shift it, uh, then you, the errors will also shift. But overall, you don't get too many errors. So basically, if you replace here f with this approximating polynomial p, you get something that you didn't change too many entries. On the other hand, you reduce the, the, you reduce the degree to this. And we know that this uh, polynomials of this degree have very, very low rank, so like this. So again, it's, it's a very, very simple uh, argument. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's still open, but by the way, I don't think it's known how to do the Alman Williams result for uh, other modern matrices with roots of unity mod three or more than two. Just two. Yeah, just it, th their proof only works for F2. And still trying to figure out. So in, it's, a, it's a diff really different proof. So they really like chop the matrix up, look at you know, the heavy things, the light things. They also use polynomial approximations, but different. So still open uh, questions. Yeah, I didn't say, oh, sorry. What? So yeah, I was going to say, so the, what are the other candidates? You were asking us what the candidates were. We, we, we heard one suggestion, but uh, yeah, he, lots of others. Right? Yeah, so the. Um, Yes, there are there are other candidates, um, Cayley Cayley matrices. The if you take a, a multiplicative character and you look at uh, uh, again it's at sums things like that. Uh, um, Van der Munde matrices for a Fourier matrix uh, over. So if you replace. And again, it, t it takes us back to the beginning of the talk, where if you replace uh, f2 to the n with zn, things are very different. So you can look at, uh, again, the cyclic matrices are more, they correspond to this group. So maybe here you don't get as many lower rank matrices as you get uh, over f2 to the n. So these would be good candidates. Um, uh, another very good candidate. Uh, is the following, I think it's a vector space of, you take a square root n by square root n blocks, you put zeros uh, outside, and you put some fixed matrix m here. So it's a, it's a vector space of dimension uh, n. And if you can show that one of the matrices in this vector space is rigid, you actually get a lower bound for a matrix multiplication. <laughs> So it's, it take all the n by n matrices that are obtained in the following way. You pick a, you pick a square root n by square root n matrix M, and you tile the diagonal with it, and you put zeros on the off diagonal okay. over any field. This, it's, a, it's a vector space of dimension f to the n inside the space of all matrices. But it's not explicit. It's explicit enough. Uh, uh, as I said before, if, if you have a vector space of dimension uh, that's only linear, it's enough to get the, the complexity applications. And this has the same dimension as this. And the, the mapping, if you multiply this by a vector, it's, it's, if you think of x as a matrix, it's like multiplying two matrices. So it's it's the complexity of this linear map is related to matrix multiplication in, the, in a sense. So I know Ron is not here, but he, he, worked, on the, he worked on this for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, it's a good candidate. Yeah. So yeah. Pattern. Yeah. Oh, and the, yeah, it's there could be more iterative methods of starting with a rigid matrix and building bigger rigid matrices out of it, some like zigzag, which, no, but yeah, but we don't we don't know anything uh, anything like that. Yep. How about codes that are built out of? Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, like rank like metric codes, you mean, or something like that? Mm -hmm. Like rank metric codes, or? Yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, like, aren't Gapa codes built that way? I mean, there are just the different things that are built out of Yeah, the yeah. Of the but you have to use some, uh, sorry, some specific property of the code, not just that it's a code. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, exactly. So you'll have to use something more than just the ha having the minimum distance. Uh, 